Hi, Tyler Stallman. If you've been dabbling with Photoshop, trying to make your images look great, but you can't quite get it there, this video is going to set you on the right track and break any bad habits you've been developing. Or better yet, if you're a complete beginner, this video is gonna prevent you from developing those bad habits in the first place. And by the end, you're gonna be using the same fundamental techniques that professional retouchers use in studios like ours. First, what is Photoshop for? How does it fit into a stack of other photography apps? Typically, you'll have one that is all about targeted pixel manipulation. So you're trying to manipulate really specific regions of the image. Other apps in this category would be Affinity Photo, Pixelmator Pro, or GIMP. But when you're editing a batch of photos and you want them to match, or you're making big adjustments to raw files like white balance or recovering blown out highlights, that is best done in raw editors like Capture One, Lightroom, or Luminar. Let's explore Photoshop's raw capabilities. I'm gonna open this in Photoshop 2021. And the best way to approach your raw step is that it's about extracting as much information and correcting the image as much as possible. This isn't the time where you really wanna bake in a strong look. So we're looking for a pretty neutral, natural, uh, both white balance and exposure. This is when you wanna save all the highlights you can because you can't save as many once it's in Photoshop. And I'm always looking up at my histogram here. Histograms are gonna be important. You can see that on the right, these are our highlights. On the left are our shadows. And we wanna make it so our highlights are just, I mean, they're gonna to have to clip because the sun is here, but you want your highlights to clip as little as possible and to keep detail in your shadows. And that's looking pretty good. So now I'm gonna open it from the raw and move into full on Photoshop. First, let's set up our workspace for photography. The default kind of sucks for everything. <laughs> so let's customize this to just the tools that we're gonna be using. And if you have been using Photoshop already, you can reset everything to the default by going to workspace, essentials default, and just go to reset essentials, and then I'll be looking at the same thing as me. First, I move the properties panel and adjustments over here to the left, and then I close library, I'm just doing that by right clicking on it, and all of these color ones over here, I right click these and say close tab group, and they all go away. If you wanna bring any of that back, you can always click on window and they are right here, like there's color. Everything is always available, but I keep these ones closed. And what I do need is I go to window in history which I then drag above layers. Now these are the two that I always have visible. And then there's a few other things I keep minimized on the side and these minimized ones are easy to pull up. And we're not gonna dive into all of these today, but it's a starting point for you to start messing around. We know that Photoshop is best at making targeted adjustments. So these are the tools that you're gonna use the most. We're gonna start with the clone brush tool. And the shortcut for that is S for stamp or sample, whatever comes to your mind first. And the way that you use it is you hold down Alt, click anywhere on the photo, and then the next place you brush will draw in that exact same area of the photo. This is a totally fundamental part of how Photoshop works and what people do with it. So I'm gonna use it for real here. And it has been there since Photoshop version one. We have always had clone stamping and it is still very useful for very many different things. Oh, and I just spotted some sensor dust here. I'm gonna zoom in and show you, which is just command plus, command minus to zoom out. And you can see it, right? This little dark spot. So now we need to get our brush to be just the right size to take that away. And we're gonna manipulate our brush settings. There's a few different ways to do that. You can either right click or two finger tap on a trackpad. And then you're able to just drag the size of your brush around. So I don't know, we'll get it to roughly match the spot. But also important is adjusting the hardness. I keep it turned to zero all the time. And that just smooths out the edges so that it more easily blends into your image. And also every single time I clone and heal, I undo and redo a few times to make sure I didn't break anything, just to take a look at before and after. And there are quicker ways to change your brush size. I use the bracket keys, which by quickly tapping them, move it up and down. You can hold it as well, or you can hold Option and Alt at the same time, drag left and right, and your brush gets bigger and smaller. And the other thing I'm constantly changing is the opacity. So it's at 100% right now. You can click this, or what you should do is press the number key. So five sets it to 50%, two will set it to 20%. As I'm painting those things in, I'm constantly adjusting it to whatever is necessary. Obviously, none of that is necessary for this photo uh, here. Okay, I'm gonna quickly retouch the rest of this photo so you can see what it looks like. I'm 
so there's a quick cleanup of this image. If you weren't sure about what the history does, you can click back at any point to see things that you've done along the way. And then down here, your layers, these are the different places that I was making changes. So here is another photo from Portugal. Anya looks amazing. By the way, you should be following her on Instagram if you don't already, but we have some tourists ruining our shot. I mean, I guess we were the we were tourists too, but these tourists, these are the bad ones. So next we're gonna come over here to the heel brush. Shortcut for that is J, short for heel, heel. And it defaults to the spot healing brush. And what happens there is as I draw over something quickly, it automatically removes the subject and it just did a great job. So for things like blemishes or gum on the ground, spot heal can work great. Let's remember to turn the hardness down to zero, but it often makes mistakes. So I actually usually switch over and you can just click and hold to do that or press shift J to the regular healing patch tool. And this works more similarly to the clone stamp. So I'm gonna, again, make the hardness zero here and I hold down alt sample an area and as I brush in, that is the area that starts to replace people. And her leg here is a good example. If I switch over to the spot healing brush and then I brush around a bunch, it starts to eat into her leg. Like it doesn't know how to process this on its own correctly. So instead I'm gonna right click and hold, go back to healing brush. And I'm gonna sample on the side of her leg, line that edge up. And now as I brush in, it understands how to keep that line of her leg going. Very important for advanced cloning. How about that? You learn some advanced techniques in a beginner video. Now layers. Um, this is one that sometimes I know beginners want to skip because it can feel like it's complicating the process, but please use layers. It is so much of why Photoshop is powerful and if you're not using it, you might as well be editing on your iPhone. I never edit a single photo without layers. So you'll remember our layers are over here and at its most basic level, a layer is just a bunch of pixels. So I could say new layer. This checkered pattern, this is what Photoshop indicates as a blank area, so it's just transparent. If I grab the brush, I can just start drawing red pixels on that layer and you can see them reflected over here. They are on the layer, nothing else. That looks awful, so let's delete all that. And layers also contain your photos. So this background layer is a layer and I could drag it onto create new layer and we get a duplicate of it and I could invert it. Now these are two different layers on top of each other. Let's delete that, let's keep it simpler. This is layer one on top of our background layer. I'm gonna zoom in and uh, keep deleting the people here. And now the proper way to do this, let's go back to our clone tool. And importantly, we need to change this from current layer to current and below. That's where it's gonna be sampling from. So the order of your layers is very important. Layer one is on top of our background layer. So when I hold alt and click, it is sampling from the background layer when I draw onto layer one. Let me change that opacity, there we go. Now, why are we going to this extra effort? Because I can hide and show layer one and I can delete mistakes and I can always go back in time and fix something that I edited too much, which happens often. This is called non-destructive editing and it's really an essential part of working inside of Photoshop. You should always try to be non-destructive whenever you can. Now you can also name your layers, which is important to do. So I usually call my cloning layer sample for some reason, I don't know when I started doing that. Let's do a slightly advanced version. I'll make my brush smaller. And if you watch, I will make this guy disappear even though he's on an awkward corner. And I'm gonna jump back and forth between clone stamp and heel brush. So I also need to change heel brush to current and below. There we go, the guy is gone. Even if we zoom into a billion percent, and if we ever regret it, we can just hide and show our layer. Oh, and there is a mistake. That is why we have layers. So now I can go to sample, press E for my erase tool, and just take out that little mistake right here. These techniques you can take to a much more advanced level. And this is usually when I tell you to subscribe to the channel to learn more about it, but I'm not gonna do that today. Instead, I'm gonna tell you to go follow me on Twitter because that's where the real dirt is. That's where I give away the good tips. All right, now a special kind of layer. Let's look at adjustment layers. Now let's go to a new photo, same trip, but now Anya is in Amsterdam. We're gonna go to layer and new adjustment layer and hue saturation. And the hue saturation layer is one that we use all the time. If you click master, you can see all the different colors in your image and manipulate them one at a time. I'm gonna select blues 
And just a shortcut of how to do something interesting with it is move your hue in the blues a little towards the left. That makes them a little more green or cyan. And this little eyeball here turns the visibility on and off of the adjustment layer. Film typically brought the blues a little more cyan, so just that one change gets us a slightly more filmic look. And there's another adjustment layer I use all the time. We're gonna create it differently. We're gonna go down to our layers panel in the lower right and click this little circle cut in half icon and use curves. First of all, you gotta know what a histogram is to really understand curves. And I'm gonna explain it very quickly. On the left are your shadows, on the right are your highlights, and up and down, that's how many pixels in the image are at that brightness level. So it looks like we got a lot of highlights in this photo. What you use curves for the most often is moving the middle point. This is all the mids of our image. And as you move them up and down, you're really affecting the exposure in a, in a pretty smooth way. This is my preferred way to change exposure once the photo has been edited through a raw processor. And similar to hue saturation, you can click this and start manipulating just one of the colors, which is also very helpful. So if you wanna warm up the image, you would you know, bring up the reds, bring down the blues, it's a little too bright. And now you've got a layer that is warming up the image and you could call it warmer. I'll often have multiple adjustment layers of curves on each photo to do some dodging and burning. But to understand that, you've got to understand masks. To understand them, think of masking tape. If you were to apply it to a surface and then spray paint over it, when you peel that tape away, you're left with a line or the original underlying surface. So the mask is everywhere that the top layer of paint isn't gonna be applied. This is the same way that it works with your layers. All right, we're gonna edit another photo. And yes, I just wanna show off all these great shots of Anya from our trip. I'm gonna open another curves adjustment layer and bring the midtones way up, way more than you think you need them to be, so they're extremely bright. And we're gonna rename this to be brighter, or you call it dodge, whatever you want. And you can see this is affecting the whole image right now. So we wanna selectively choose which parts it's gonna affect. And over here, this is the mask. This white square is the shape of the mask on the screen. So to change it, we wanna use the fastest possible way. So I'm just gonna tell you the shortcuts, press D, look over here on the left, this selects default colors, which are white on the top, black on the bottom. And if I press Command Delete, it fills my current layer with whatever my background layer is. So it filled it with black. If I Alt click, you can see what the mask looks like. So now I wanna reveal that bright curves layer. I'm gonna go over here and select the brush tool with B. And it works just the same as the others. Make sure your hardness is down. I'm gonna make it pretty big on this one. Lower my opacity a bit and just start painting in the areas that I want to be a bit brighter. Again, I keep changing them as I go. And now you can see if you take a close look at this brighter layer, there is the shape of the mask and everything that you draw, like I'll draw some really white lines, you can see it show up in that little mask preview. Let's say we wanted to darken part of the image, do the same thing, another curves layer, bring it down in the center. I press the D key to get my default colors, click here. Command, delete, and it fills it. And then we can paint in white areas anywhere that we want to be darker. Again, let's look at our mask. Those are the areas that become a little darker. And as you're painting, like I'm gonna go back to my brighter tool, you can press the X key and over here on the left, you can see the colors are switching, which one is on the top and the bottom. If I put the black on the top, my brush starts to remove that white area and make the mask invisible wherever I'm painting. And now that we've cleaned up our image, it's a good time to give it a filmic look. It's only gonna take a couple of clicks, but first, I wanna thank Squarespace. You can Photoshop absolute works of art, but what fun is it if nobody can see those in high resolution and optimized for the web? The best way to do that is with Squarespace. They have mobile ready templates that both look great on a desktop or on a phone, and they resize the images to be optimized for that screen so people are getting the best possible viewing experience of your work. Not only is it easy to build beautiful galleries for your photography, but you can also build a membership section so that you can monetize your audience and they can support your work by having special access to additional content that you're creating. And it really is easy to get started, but still have the powerful tools like SEO and analytics that you need to run a real website. So go over to Squarespace and you can start creating a free trial right now. In a few minutes, you'll be up and running. And then when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash Tyler Stallman, and you're gonna get 10% off your first website or domain. So remember, offer code Tyler Stallman for 10% off 
And thanks again, Squarespace. All right, now I promised it's easy to add a filter. First, you gotta download some LUTs. I have a few available for sale, but there's a lot more out there. Obviously, you've heard people talking about their LUTs before. I'm gonna use mine for this example. We're gonna go to our adjustment layers, create one called Color Lookup, which is Color Lookup Table. That's LUT, Lookup Table. And up here, you wanna click on Load 3D LUT. These are the built-in ones from Adobe. They're not very good, but you can play with them if you really want. And I'm gonna select my film emulation, and there it is, that's it. I only include one in mine, but there are so many out there that you can use. And yeah, if we flip before and after, I mean, it just totally transforms the photo. All right, and now I think you're ready to learn about actions. There's this one action that I run on every single photo I edit. As soon as I open an image, I run it and then I start editing. And you can download it for free or you can build it yourself. I got a whole video breaking it all down. Anyway, hope that was helpful guys.